Good day, children. I hope you're all fine. I'm Anupreet Kaur from the Chandigarh Education Department. Children, have you ever made excuses about having a headache or a stomach ache when you don't want to do your work or when you don't want to go to school? Yes, perhaps at some time or the other in your life. But children, today we will study about two great personalities, two extraordinary gentlemen who were leading their lives in wheelchairs due to major illnesses, Firdaus Kanga and Stephen Hawking. Firdaus Kanga is a great journalist. He was born with brittle bones and due to that, he had to li live his life in a wheelchair. He could not stand or walk. Stephen Hawking was a great astrophysicist. He was a great cosmologist and a great writer. All this despite the fact that he suffered from a neuromotor disorder. He was totally paralyzed and yet he achieved such great heights in his life. Children, today we will read about them in the lesson a Visit to Cambridge by Firdaus Kanga. This is an excerpt from his travelogue, Heaven on Wheels. This is from your book, Honeydew for class eight. So children, let's know more about the meeting of these two great gentlemen. Firdaus Kanga is an Indian writer and actor who lives in London. He has written a novel, Trying to Grow, a semi-autobiographical novel set in India and a travel book, Heaven on Wheels, about his experiences in the United Kingdom. He was born in 1960 in Mumbai. And a movie has been made on his novel, Sixth Happiness. Today, let's read a lesson, A Visit to Cambridge, which is an excerpt from his book, Heaven on Wheels. Cambridge was my metaphor for England, and it was strange that when I left, it had become altogether something else because I had met Stephen Hawking there. So children, for the writer Firdaus Kanga, Cambridge represented England. For him, Cambridge was the real England. Whenever he thought of Cambridge, he thought of England as such. It was strange that this feeling that Cambridge represented England for him changed once he left Cambridge. And the reason for it was that he had met Stephen Hawking. Because after that time, Stephen Hawking became the metaphor for England for him. It was on a walking tour through Cambridge that the guide mentioned Stephen Hawking. Poor man, who is quite disabled now, though he is a worthy successor to Isaac Newton, whose chair he has at the university. So the guide tells Firdaus Kanga when they were on a tour to Cambridge that Stephen Hawking lived there and he called him a poor man. Was Stephen Hawking poor? Did he not have much money? No, over here the guide means to say that Stephen Hawking was disabled. So he felt sorry for his disability. But he says at the same time that he was a very great scientist. That is what made him a worthy successor to Isaac Newton. Children, you're all aware of Isaac Newton, the greatest of scientists. So he feels that Stephen Hawking is at par with him. And whose chair he has at the university. So children, the chair, the concept of a chair is that it represents a professorship. Henry Lucas had set up this chair with a stipend and a salary for the professor who held it. It was for the great mathematicians and scientists. And the greatest of mathematicians and scientists have sat in this chair, have held this chair since that time. People like Isaac Newton, Charles Babbage, and Stephen Hawking. And I started because I had quite forgotten that this 
most brilliant and completely paralyzed astrophysicist, the author of A Brief History of Time, one of the biggest bestsellers ever lived there. So, you know, he's uh, startled, he's very shocked and surprised. He says, oh my God, how could I have forgotten that this brilliant scientist, this great astrophysicist lived in Cambridge. An astrophysicist is a scholar of astrophysics, which is a branch of physics dealing with stars, planets, etc. He was a cosmologist and he had written a very famous book, A Brief History of Time, which is one of the biggest bestsellers. It has sold millions of copies worldwide and it has been translated into many languages. And children, would you believe it that when he wrote this book, he was paralyzed. Despite his condition, despite his physical setbacks, he managed to write a book. And sometimes people just make excuses over little, little things that, oh, they did not have the time, oh, they did not have the, you know, we were hurt, we were injured, we had a stomach ache, we have a headache, so we don't go to school, we find excuses not to do homework. I think we should all take the example of Stephen Hawking we should all learn from him not to take little, little problems in our life as excuses. Rather, we should just take all these obstacles in our stride and find ways and means to get over them and ahead of them and live our life to the best, to the most optimum and achieve the greatest heights that we can. Rather than find excuses, we should make more efforts and get over our difficulties. So whatever our conditions, whatever our state, we should get, make a special effort to do well in life, to achieve the maximum that we can. When the walking tour was done, I rushed to a phone booth and almost tearing the cord so that it could reach me outside phoned Stephen Hawking's house. Children, now the condition here is that Firdaus Ganga himself is in a wheelchair. You are aware that he suffered from brittle bones. When he was born, he had brittle bones, which would break very easily when he was a child. So because of this condition, he had to sit in a wheelchair. Now, because he's in a wheelchair, he cannot go inside the phone booth. So he pulls at the cord of the phone, which can reach him outside the booth. He talks to Stephen Hawking's assistant. There was his assistant on the line, and I told him, I had come in a wheelchair from India. Perhaps he thought I had propelled myself all the way <laughs> to write about my travels in Britain. I had to see Professor Hawking. Even 10 minutes would do. Half an hour, he said, from 3.30 to 4. So when he's telling the assistant that he'd come from India, all the way from India in a wheelchair, he sets in a humorous comment over here, saying that maybe the assistant thought that he had propelled the wheelchair. He had pushed his wheelchair all the way from India to England which of course is not true. He must have gone by air, and he's of course moving around in his wheelchair over there, but he's trying to make it a little uh, humorous over here. So how much time does he get with uh, Stephen Hawking? He gets an appointment for half an hour from 3.30 to 4. And suddenly I felt weak all over. Growing up disabled, you get fed up with people asking you to be brave. As if you have a courage account on which you are too lazy to draw a check. The only thing that makes you stronger is seeing somebody like you, achieving something huge. Then you know how much is possible and you reach out further than you ever thought you could. So he, he's feeling very weak all over. 
he is feeling nervous and he is also very excited. Why is Firdaus Kanga nervous? Because he is going to meet such a great scientist who is renowned all over the world, the greatest of astrophysicists, one of the best authors who has written a brief history of time, who has done so much of research on our universe, on our cosmos. So he's very excited to meet him for the same very reasons. He says that growing up disabled, you get fed up with people asking you to be brave. He says, everyone says, oh, be brave. You know, you are disabled. Uh, you know, you've got to be strong. He had his problems. He suffered from brittle bones. For him, it was not easy to move around. Anytime he'd fall, he would break a bone. So it wasn't easy to just deal with these commands saying, be brave. It's not like you have an account in the bank, a, a courage account from which you can go and draw out some courage. It's not like that. And it's not as if one is too lazy to draw out, uh, to draw a check to get some courage from the bank. No. Of course, they are, as it is, showing a lot of courage. People like Firdaus Kanga who have to face these major difficulties in life. People like Stephen Hawking, they are showing a great deal of courage to lead, try and lead a normal life. So here he feels it's just easier said than done to say that, okay, show some courage, be brave, be strong. The only thing that makes you stronger is seeing somebody like you achieving something huge. So what gives you real strength is when you see somebody who is in a similar situation as you, who is, in, who is facing similar problems as you. When you see that person achieving something huge, something big in life, then you become strong. Because then you say to yourself, if he can do it, so can I. Like for him, he sees that if Stephen Hawking can achieve such great heights despite his major disabilities, despite the fact that he is paralyzed, despite the fact that he cannot even move, he is achieving such great heights. He is such a great astrophysicist. He is even writing books. He's doing so much of research. If he can do it, why can't I? Why can't I achieve greatness? Why can't I do something big with my life? Then you know how much is possible and you reach out further than you ever thought you could. So this, he sets greater heights, higher limits of achievement. So this is how when he has a great role model like Stephen Hawking, he also decides to do so much more with his life, to achieve so much more. Because you realize how much is possible, how much greatness is possible. You set your summits higher. You know, as we read in the previous lessons, there also we're talking about achieving greatness overcoming the difficulties, overcoming the obstacles in life and achieving our aims. So here the aims can be set higher. Here the potential is greater. The achievements become greater when you see somebody like you who is achieving something huge. I haven't been brave, said his disembodied computer voice the next afternoon. I've had no choice. So what is this disembodied computer voice? Children here, we're talking about Stephen Hawking, talking through his computer, talking through the voice synthesizer in the computer. Children, Stephen Hawking suffered from neuromotor disorder, because of which he became paralytic. He had these paralytic attacks and then he lost his 
voice. He had had a tracheotomy in his neck. There was a surgery in his neck after which he had lost his voice. If he did not have the surgery, he would not have survived. He would have died. So he had to lose his voice in order to save his life. Now he says, I have not been brave. I have had no choice. He says, I didn't have any choice in life. It's not that I was brave to go on with it. So now he's not able to talk. He talks through the computer. He presses the buttons on the computer and he selects the words which are to be said. So the computer, the voice synthesizer speaks out those words. So it is not his voice, it is the voice of the computer. And it is called disembodied because this voice does not have a body. It is not coming from Stephen Hawking's body. It is coming from the computer. So it is a disembodied computer voice. Surely I wanted to say, living creatively with the reality of his disintegrating body was a choice. So the writer says, that living with this disintegrating body, children, with, because of this neuromotor disorder, his body, which, uh, you know, he got this illness at the age of 22. He was still studying in the University of Cambridge when he got this illness, when they realized that he had this neuromotor disorder. And at that time, the doctor said he would survive only for two years. But thanks to the medical science and thanks to his own willpower, he lived on till the age of 76. He died in March 2018. The writer feels that Stephen Hawking had a choice. What was the choice? He could either have just not done anything in life, he could have just taken his disintegrating body, his paralysis and as, as an excuse to not do anything in life. But he didn't. He worked hard and achieved such greatness. But I kept quiet because I felt guilty every time I spoke to him, forcing him to respond. There he was, tapping at the little switch in his hand, trying to find the words on his computer with the only bit of movement left to him his long pale fingers. So here the sad part is because Stephen Hawking cannot talk. So the writer feels very guilty in forcing him to answer the questions when he asks them. Because Stephen Hawking has to press the switch in his hand to find the words in the computer to be able to answer him, which is a great effort for Stephen Hawking because it is only his long pale fingers which have some movement left in them. The rest of his body is paralyzed. So for him, it is very exhausting, very tiring to find the words on the computer and answer the questions asked by Firdaus Kanga or anybody else at any time. Every so often, his eyes would shut in frustrated exhaustion and sitting off opposite him, I could feel his anguish the mind buoyant with thoughts that came out in frozen phrases and sentences stiff as corpses. Children, look at this language that Firdaus Kanga has used. Put opposing words in the same sentence. Buoyant, which is full of life, which is active and frozen and corpses in the same sentence. Firdaus Kanga says that I, he felt really sorry for Stephen Hawking because he was very frustrated and tired trying to find the right words to answer him. And Firdaus Kanga could feel his pain, his anguish, because he realizes that Stephen Hawking's mind is very brilliant. It is very active and vibrant. It's full of great thoughts. And yet, those thoughts come out in the form of frozen phrases and sentences which are like corpses, like dead bodies. Why are they frozen? Because they're coming in through the voice synthesizer in a very flat tone. A lot of people seem to think that disabled people are chronically unhappy, I said. I know that's not true myself. 
are you often laughing inside? So the writer asks Hawking if he's laughing inside, if he finds the world funny. He says that people with disabilities are very sad all the time, but that's not true. About three minutes later, he responded, I find it amusing when people patronize me. So it took Stephen Hawking quite some time to find the words to answer for Das Ganga. He says, I find it very amusing when people patronize me. So when people think that they are superior to him in some form, that they, because they are, uh, let's say, normal, so they feel that he needs some help and they could, you know, so he feels that those people patronize him. And he finds it very amusing. He says, like, I mean, why? And do you find it annoying when someone like me comes and disturbs you in your work? <laughs> the answer flashed, yes. So here we have Stephen Hawking at his very honest self. He tells him that, yes, I do find it annoying when people disturb me in my work. Then he smiled his one-way smile. And I knew without being sentimental or silly that I was looking at one of the most beautiful men in the world. So when Stephen Hawking smiled, his one-way smile because he's paralyzed from one side, and he says, then I saw with his smile that he was the most beautiful man in the world. So Stephen Hawking has a one-way smile because his face is paralyzed. And Firdaus Kanga says that he's not being sentimental or silly, but he felt that he was looking at one of the most beautiful men in the world, a man who could smile in the face of such great difficulties. In the face of paralysis, in the face of a situation where he could not move at all, despite all these things, he could smile. And that is what made him so beautiful. His honesty and his smile made him beautiful. Children, let's have a quiz now. Stephen Hawking was an astrophysicist, a chemist, a journalist, an astronaut. An astrophysicist. Very good. Stephen Hawking was an astrophysicist. Well done. Cambridge was my metaphor for England. To the writer, Cambridge was a reputed university in England. England was famous for Cambridge. Cambridge was the real England or Cambridge was the largest city in England? Cambridge was the real England. That is right. So when the writer says Cambridge was my metaphor for England, he meant that Cambridge for him was the real England. The writer phoned Stephen Hawking's house from the best phone booth, from outside a phone booth, from inside a phone booth, or from his room? From outside a phone booth. That is correct. Firdaus Kanga, the writer, called Hawking from outside a phone booth because the options are he was in a wheelchair, the booth was very crowded, the booth was dirty, or he was sitting in his car. He was in a wheelchair. That's the correct answer. So he had to stay outside the phone booth because he was in a wheelchair. He could not get his wheelchair inside the booth. The next question is, the writer was very excited to meet Hawking because the options are, he was going to have tea with him. He was his best friend. Hawking was his role model. Hawking was his new teacher. Hawking was his role model. That is correct. The next question is, according to the writer, the only thing that makes you stronger is, the options are, drinking milk, going to the gym, seeing someone like you, achieving something huge, eating healthy food. Seeing someone like you, achieving something huge. That is correct. So in the case of the writer, 
Firdaus Kanga, he saw Stephen Hawking achieve such great heights that made him stronger, that made him realize that he could achieve the same things or something as great as Stephen Hawking's had achieved. Firdaus Kanga felt guilty every time he spoke to Stephen Hawking because the options are he forced Hawking to use his voice synthesizer, Hawking was sleepy, Hawking was writing a book, Hawking was thinking deeply about something. He forced Hawking to use his voice synthesizer. Very good, that's the correct answer. He felt that he was troubling Stephen Hawking. Children, I would like you to state whether the following statements are true or false. Stephen Hawking lived in Cambridge. True. That's right. Hawking was poor. False. Yes, he was not a poor man. A guide called him a poor man. That was because of his physical disability, not because he did not have money. Stephen Hawking was a worthy successor to Isaac Newton's chair. True. That is right. They were both great scientists. Stephen Hawking wrote A Brief History of Time. True. This very famous book of his has sold over a million copies. Firdaus Kanga was very excited about meeting Hawking. True. You're right. Firdaus Kanga was a very close friend of Stephen Hawking. False. That is correct. It, it was in fact the first time that he was meeting Stephen Hawking. Let's have another activity. I would like you to complete the sentences using the right form of the adjective given in the brackets. An aeroplane is the dash mode of travel. The word is fast. An aeroplane is the fastest mode of travel. Very good. This is the dash dress I have ever had. The option is beautiful. This is the most beautiful dress I ever had. Very well done. Today's test was dash than yesterday's. And the word is easy. Today's test was easier than yesterday's. Very good. This is a very dash book. The word is interesting. This is a very interesting book. Great. You're good. Ravi and Sonia are both dash. The word is tall. Ravi and Sonia are both tall. That's right. Now here you have used tall for two people. That is because they're both tall. If one, one of them was tall and the other was not, then you would have used a different form, right? So let's see what you do in the next sentence. Their son Raj is dash than them. The word is tall. Their son Raj is taller than them. That's right. So Ravi and Sonia, because they were both tall, so you use the word tall. And the son is taller than them. That is how you got this right as well. Noor is as dash as Sonia. The word is smart. Noor is as smart as Sonia. Yes, so you'll use the first form because they are both smart. Very well done, child. Now, let's do one more activity. You have to use either or or both in the blanks. Bunny has two friends. Dash are intelligent. Bunny has two friends. Both are intelligent. Correct. There are 40 children in the class. Dash are regular. There are 40 children in the class. All are regular. Good. Dash her parents came for the meeting. Both her parents came for the meeting. Good. Dash her hands were full. Both her hands were full. Very good. Dash the children must come to school in proper uniform. All the children must come to school in proper uniform. Very well done. So when we talk about two people, we use both. And when we talk about more than two people, we use all. Now, let's have another fun activity. I would like you to make meaningful sentences from the jumbled words. 
The words for the first sentence are metaphor, Cambridge, England, was, my, for. Cambridge was my metaphor for England. Good. That was quick. The words for the second sentence are met, had, there, I, Stephen Hawking. I had met Stephen Hawking there. Good. The words for the third sentence are astrophysicist, Stephen Hawking, great, a, uh, was. Stephen Hawking was a great astrophysicist. That's great. Very good. The words for the fourth sentence are time, history, wrote, he, brief, a, uh, of. He wrote a brief history of time. Very well done. Now children, there's another activity that I would like you to do at home. I would like you to write a paragraph on your role model on a person who inspires you on somebody whose footsteps you'd like to follow children are you all impressed as i am on having read about stephen hawking the great astrophysicist the man who despite his physical disability despite his paralysis his neuromotor disorder has achieved such great heights, who despite the fact that he could not move his body, has written a, an amazing book, A Brief History of Time, which is a bestseller, which has sold millions of copies worldwide. We learn so much from these two men, Firdaus Kanga, the great journalist, and Stephen Hawking, the great astrophysicist, the cosmologist. We learn that one should not give up in the face of hardships. One should be able to live the life to the fullest despite the great disabilities. One should overcome the disabilities and the obstacles in life and achieve one's aims and achieve greatness. We will read more about them from the book Honeydew in our next session.